welcome to Hope City. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad that you guys are here today. And if you haven't no, if you can't tell already, we're in a series that we're starting today called Greater. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about how to make a greater choice and how every single day we're faced with choices that we can make that are going to turn our life in a direction. And it's not necessarily our intentions that determine our direction, it's our choices. And so we're going to be talking about it over the next few weeks. If you're a guest with us today, so glad that you're here. I know you could be a lot of different places. And uh, we're honored that you would be here. One of the things we say around here all the time is uh, you can belong before you believe. And if you couldn't tell by that skit, that is really true, okay? And so no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, uh, you can uh, belong before you believe. And we're just uh, grateful that you're here. So I wanted, what I want to do to start out the, ser- the service today is I wanted to kind of have a little um, audience interaction. We're going to talk about... What is the greater choice in your life? Okay, so I brought a few examples with me. We're just going to vote here and, uh, and kind of walk through these. So Coke or Pepsi? Which, which, which would you think? Who thinks that Coke is greater? All right, okay. Who thinks Pepsi is greater? How does Pepsi even exist, right? Does, do, does anyone even drink Pepsi? I mean, Mountain Dew has to carry Pepsi. They have to carry Pepsi because I think Coke is, is obviously greater. Okay, uh, next one would be uh, pancakes or waffles. Who are my pancake people? Anybody have pancakes? Okay, wow, that's, that's uh, surprisingly low, surprisingly low. How about waffles? Who thinks waffles are greater? Okay, I'm not really taking your vote into account. It's really what I want. This is what pancakes are greater, okay? Uh, pan, in my opinion, pancakes are greater. All right, next one would be NFL or NBA? Who would think, who says the NFL is, is better, is greater? Okay, who thinks the NBA is greater? Who doesn't care? All right, I'm going to say NFL is greater. There's 16 games in the NFL season. Every game matters a lot more than the NBA, so I'm going to say NFL. And Pacers aren't really that good, so it doesn't really matter to me as much anymore. So that, anyway, so the next one would be Mario or Luigi. Who would say Mario was better, all right, or who's greater? Okay, who thinks Luigi is greater? All right, all right. <laughs> Who's never played Nintendo? Okay, I would say Mario obviously is greater. She does say, he does save the princess. Uh, last one would be um, Democrat or Republicans. No, we're not going there, okay? It's just a joke. There's no way I'm going to put up a sign up there, all right? I just thought I would just keep you on your toes a little bit. Uh, if I want to know your opinion, I'll check Facebook, okay? And, and we'll, we'll argue about it on Facebook. But today what I want to talk about is I want to talk about, I want to kick off the series and talk about a concept that I think we get backwards at times in the church. And it's not even intentional, and it's not um, sinister, or it's, it's, not, um, it's not something that we do uh, with ulterior motives. I think it's just how we drift as people who are trying to follow God. And I want to talk about which is greater. I want to talk about, is it greater to be perfect, or is it greater to be real? Which is greater? And I think so often in the American church, we've been conditioned to think being perfect is greater than being real. But as we're going to look at today, Jesus always values authenticity over perfection. He always chooses to be around people who are honest about their flaws rather than pretentious about their flaws. He chooses to be around people who are obviously the least, and he allows them to be greater because of their dependence on him. And what, what I think fuels our desire to be perfect, what fuels our um, drift toward perfection at the cost of being real is fear. I mean, if we really are honest with ourselves and, and honest with one another, what, what if who I am isn't enough? What if I'm rejected by the people that I love the most? What if I don't have what it takes to be good at my job? What if I always come up short of my boss's expectations? What if I'm not the husband or the wife that I promised I would be? What if I am not able to be the parent that my kids desperately need me to be? What, what if I fail in this dating relationship? This fear causes us to pretend to be better than we're, what we really are. And so what we do is we fake being perfect over choosing to be real. And, and this happens all the time. And if, now that I say this, you're probably gonna catch yourself in, in, in the context of church because we'll be out in the lobby of the church or outside the church and we'll be like, hey, how you doing? And all of us will say, I'm doing great. Very rarely do people say, I'm just doing horrible. I've had a horrible week. My wife's mad at me. My kids can't t- stand me. I'm not talking to my boss, right? We don't say that because why? That person's high maintenance and we want to clear, steer clear of them, right? So we always drift to faking being perfect and we cost ourselves the opportunity to be authentic, the, the life that we long for is found in authenticity, not perfection. 
So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I want to look at a story in Luke chapter 7 where this is kind of illustrated. And this is a, an encounter that a woman has with Jesus in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. It says this. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. So this is at a religious leader's home. This is not in private, this is in public. Typically what would happen is they would have these dinners. If you picture your deck on your back porch, flip it and put all the parties that you have out in the front yard. And that's what these people in this culture would do. They would have all these parties. And if you were invited to the party, you were able to sit at the table. And if you weren't invited to the party, you could still observe the party. You just couldn't come in. So that, this, this religious leader invites Jesus over for dinner. And this woman shows up. And she doesn't stand on the outside. She goes right into the party. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who it is that's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And he says, tell me, teacher. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, well, I suppose the one that has the bigger debt canceled. You judge correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I've entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she has loved much. But he who has been forgiven of little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So there's this dynamic that's going on. Jesus starts recounting all of the customary things that would have taken place or that should have taken place as an honored guest at a meal. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher of the law. and So he was invited by a religious leader to this house and customarily, there would have been the washing of feet because feet get dirty. And so as you enter someone's home as a guest, you would wash their feet. And that does not happen. So this woman starts wetting his feet with her tears. And typically, as an honored guest, you would have a, give a customary kiss of greeting. And that did not happen. And this woman starts kissing Jesus' feet over and over again. And typically, if someone was esteemed like a rabbi or a teacher or someone who had a lot of political clout or a lot of financial clout, they would anoint the head with oil as a sign of peace, as a gesture of peace, that they're welcome into the home, and that didn't happen. And so this woman pours an alabaster jar of perfume. Another translation, another account of this story in another one of the Gospels says that this woman poured out all of the perfume, which was about a year's worth of salary, onto Jesus' feet. And so Jesus starts using this woman and what she is doing as an illustration of what it looks like to live an authentic life. So what I want to do this morning is I want to look at this story and I want to talk about the pathway that you and I can walk on to pursue authenticity, to pursue being real over being perfect. And if you, if you have a, your app, I'd like to encourage you to take, take it out and, and look at the notes. We're going to kind of walk through some different principles and at the end of each of the principles, I'm going to give you an application question that's not on the outline, okay? And I, I think maybe in the seven or eight months that we've been existing as a church, I've maybe asked you to write stuff down maybe two or three times. I want to encourage you to write these uh, questions down because I think they're going to be beneficial for us as we go through this series because this is going to kind of set the foundation for the series because the, the big idea of this series is this. What we value determines our choices and our choices determine our direction. And so as we choose what is greater, these questions are going to guide us through the process of pursuing what is real in our life. Okay, so the first principle that I see in this passage is realize, that we need to realize that brokenness is not weakness. So this, here in Luke 7, this prostitute, as it's translated in another telling of this passage, she crashes this dinner party, and all these people are up in arms. And she falls at the feet of Jesus, and she begins to weep. And she is aware of her lifestyle. She doesn't try to appear to be spiritual. She's desperate. And she lowers her hair, and she begins to wipe Jesus' feet with her tears. 
And these, this religious leader knows exactly who this woman is. Her reputation precedes her. And so this takes place in verse 37. It says, when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was at a Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his feet weeping and she began to wet his feet with her tears. See, she wasn't pretending to be strong. She was accepting her brokenness. She, she wasn't pretending to be more spiritual or more put together. She was just falling at the feet of Jesus in desperate need of grace. There, there's, a, there's a saying that, um, I, I don't know who actually said it, but um, I read it online several different times that when Jesus is all you have, you realize that Jesus is all you need. And that's where this woman is. She's at the feet of Jesus and she's desperate because she knows she has no other hope. And there's this realization that when, when we stop pretending that we're not broken, we can actually experience wholeness. That we, we, don't, we can't experience wholeness by pretending that we're not broken. Jesus can't heal the parts of our heart we pretend aren't wounded. We pretend aren't broken. We are, we are able to experience God's love and receive God's love in deeper ways when we admit our weakness. God won't make us into what we pretend to be. And for many of us, I think we struggle with this because we want to appear strong. We want to appear put together. We want to appear like we're pursuing God in a way that other people will approve of. But many of us aren't free because we pretend we aren't in bondage. We aren't strong because we pretend we have no weaknesses. We aren't whole because we pretend we aren't broken. We aren't pure because we pretend we don't struggle with purity. We, we, our marriage isn't growing because we pretend like it's healthy. We can't forgive because we pretend like we don't hold grudges. We, we don't live with joy because we pretend like we're always happy. And, and so we have this false sense of security. We have this false sense of of being put together, and God is saying, hey, you know where I show up the most? In brokenness. And when you realize that brokenness isn't weakness, that's when my strength becomes your strength. And we don't experience transformation because we pretend like we don't need change. And can I just say, just from personal experience, pretending to be more put together than you really are is exhausting. It's just life-sucking, right? And that's why so many Christians, I think, are so tired, and you, you look at people and you think, man, do you really love God? Do you know that God loves you? Right, because we live our life as if God hates us because we're so busy pretending to be something that we're not, we can't enjoy the life that we actually have. Brokenness and healing both start at the feet of Jesus. That's where it started for this woman. And so here's the application question as it relates to this. Am I pretending to be stronger than I really am? Like in your life, in your marriage, in your career, in your parenting, in your dating relationships, are, are you pretending to be better than you really are? And this might not even be to other people, right? This might just be purely to yourself. Because we can't be honest with others until we're actually honest with ourselves. And maybe the greatest step you can take in choosing being real over being perfect is just admitting to yourself, hey, I, I'm not put together. I am weak. And that brokenness is not weakness. It's actually setting you up to experience God's power. Uh, the next principle, the next thing on this path to, to being real is we need to let go of people pleasing. That's going to hurt, all right? That's going to hurt. I'm, I'm just preaching myself right now. It's, that hurts. Let go of people pleasing. Verse 39 says this, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, saw the woman uh, anointing Jesus' feet, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman that she is, that she is a sinner. One of the things that amazes me about this story is this woman had a greater desire to encounter Jesus than she did to please people. And I don't know that I can always say that. I don't know that I can always say my greatest desire is to not please people, it's to encounter Jesus. And all of us have this desire to be liked, to fit in, to be popular. From the time that we're kids, we're placed in these social ranks on the playground and in the classroom and we're given titles and we're given labels. And it's based on our family's income, our personality, our athletic ability, our artistic uh, giftedness, our academic skills. And we are conditioned to perform to please others. It's how, it's, how we're, it's how we're wired. And if we're not careful, what happens is we begin to live for the approval of others rather than from the approval of God. Like you already know you're, you're approved by God, right? You're accepted by God. 
And so we live for something that's so fleeting, that's so conditional. We, we live for people liking us rather than from the approval that God has already given us through Jesus. And it makes us miserable. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I think I, I've made in ministry, and people ask me all the time since um, our, my marriage imploded when we started our first church, like what's different now that you started your second church? It's been 15 years since we started our first church and 12 years since I, w- I left being the pastor there. And so starting over with Hope City a couple years ago, it was a little intimidating. And I, and I think the greatest difference is I have a greater desire to please God than I do to please you. And I couldn't say that 12 years ago. In fact, we, we had a board of directors at our old church. And any, with any startup, like you're, you're kind of week to week for a while, right? Like you're just kind of watching the attendance, you're watching the offering, you're like crossing your fingers, right? You're like doing a little rain dance. Like you do whatever it takes to make sure that, you know, you're going to be able to cover the bills for the next month. And I remember we got into this pattern where I would have a, a different board member pretty much every Monday call me and say, hey, what was our attendance yesterday? What was our offering yesterday? What was our tennis? What was our offering? And I began to feel driven by proving myself through those numbers rather than just doing ministry to please God. And it wasn't those board members who were wrong. It was my desire to please them that got sideways. And it allowed me to change my focus, allowed me to change my mission of just helping people find their way back to God to making sure that we had trending numbers that were up. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but my guess is you're tempted at times to not necessarily live your life to please God as much as you are to please others. There's this passage of scripture in in 1 Samuel um, chapter 15 in in the Old Testament, and King Saul was the first king of Israel. He was like this amazing leader. He was a handsome guy. He had this large stature. I'm, I'm guessing he was pretty buff, very handsome, very put together, came from a great family. And God chose him to be anointed and appointed as the first king of Israel, basically to replace God, because up to that point, God was the king of Israel. And so this guy was the, not just the political and military leader of the nation of Israel, he, was, he became the spiritual leader of the nation of Israel. And the reason that he lost his ability to lead, the reason that God replaced him with King David wasn't because he made some horrendous political move. It wasn't because he conquered a kingdom when he wasn't supposed to conquer a kingdom. It was because he gave in to the desire that he had to please people over pleasing God. In fact, in in verse 24 of chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, it says this. This is King Saul talking. He says, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. Then look at this last statement. I think we could all say this. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. It's a powerful statement. And people pleasing cost Saul his kingdom. And so oftentimes I think it costs us our joy. And it costs us um, our ability to be real because we're constantly trying to please everybody in our life. We value acceptance more more than we value authenticity. And in the process, we lose both. Because the acceptance that we have is this false sense of acceptance because we know we're not being our authentic selves. We feel like we're performing for people. You perform at your job and you perform for your spouse and you perform for your friends and, and you get this sideshow basically working in your life where you don't even know who you are anymore. Living to please others is exhausting and it's a miserable way to live. And so here's the application question. Am I more concerned with pleasing God than I am with pleasing people? Like, like what, what keeps you up at night? What, what, what is the desire of your heart? Pleasing people or pleasing God? Because here's, here's what I've learned. If I can really do my best and if I can really surrender to this desire to please God, I'm going to please the right people. I'm always going to hack somebody off. Okay, I mean, I put up a video of my son draining a three-pointer last night on Instagram and somebody called me out for my son trash talking. Okay, like within five minutes of me posting it. Okay, so I'm always going to make somebody mad. It was a great shot. I would have trash talked too. But anyway, um, so, uh, but you know what? I went to sleep last night completely confident that the sun was going to come up tomorrow and I don't really need that guy in my life. And so if you're going to allow the opinions of people to drive you, you're going to be constantly miserable. But if you allow the heart of God to drive you, you're going to please the right people. Okay, the next principle here in, in being real is be brutally honest with God. 
be brutally honest with God. Why is it that we can trust God with our eternity, but we can't trust him with our honesty? Like most of us who are in a relationship with God, we've accepted Jesus, right? We, we believe that Jesus is the son of God, and we believe that a relationship with him leads to eternity with him in heaven. That's, that's our core belief. And we can trust God with the rest of our eternity, but we can't trust him enough to be honest. Isn't that whack? Isn't that kind of messed up? That we think we have to fake our way with God too. And what happens is when, when you are dishonest with God, when you hold back your honesty with God, trust is broken. The foundation of any relationship is trust, and the pathway to trust is honesty. You can't have trust in a relationship until you have honesty. And so we compromise honesty and we allow unspoken hurts and silent disappointments and unmet expectations to build a wall between ourselves and God. And then we don't understand why we don't experience intimacy with God. It's because we're not being fully honest. There's this amazing passage in um, John chapter 1. And Jesus has you know, a few good friends outside of his disciples. And Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are a family that Jesus is really close with. And Lazarus gets really sick. And so Mary and Martha send word with a messenger to Jesus that Lazarus, actually they say the, the one that you love is sick. So they don't even give him my name. They, they, he knows, Jesus is going to know who he is. Well, he's God, he knows everything. But they give him that name to invoke this emotion in Jesus. Hey, you can make a difference here. Lazarus is sick. And you know what the Bible says in John chapter 1? That upon receiving that information, Jesus stayed where he was two more days. He was in no rush to get to Lazarus. And you know what happened? Lazarus died. And so Jesus arrives a few days later. Lazarus has been in the grave for three days. And Mary and Martha are not pretending to be okay. They, they approach Jesus when they see him a long way off. They don't even wait for Jesus to get there. They go to him and they go off on him. And it says in, in, um, in, in John chapter 1, this is uh, Martha talking. She says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Like she doesn't hold back. She doesn't like pretend that Jesus, because he's the son of God, I can't really be honest with him. She's like, you know what? You could have done something about this and you didn't show up. And so he's dead and it's all your fault. And I don't know how often you've thought that but not been willing to say that when it comes to your relationship with God. She says, if you would have been here, Jesus, if you'd have just shown up, this would not have happened. And maybe for some of you, the greatest step you can take toward being real is just having an honest conversation with Jesus. Jesus, if you would have shown up, my marriage would not have failed. Jesus, if you would have shown up, I wouldn't have lost my job. Jesus, if you would have shown up, he would not have broken up with me. Jesus, if you would have shown up, we wouldn't have lost that pregnancy. Jesus, if you would have shown up, I'd have a better relationship with my kids. Like what area of your life are you just holding back because you don't think God can handle your honesty? If God can't handle your honesty, he's not really God. God is big enough to handle your doubts, your disappointments, and your accusations. What he can't handle is your inauthenticity. Right? He can't heal the parts of your heart that you're not honest about. And so if you want to experience intimacy with God, intimacy is born out of being fully known. You have to allow God to know the darkest and the most hurtful parts of your heart. And it doesn't mean it's going to change overnight Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. So that's not really fair, okay? Like that's, 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 that, the end of the story isn't as important as the middle of the story, okay? We use the end of the story at Easter, okay? But the point is, authenticity is the birthplace of trust. And if you want to experience being real in your life, it starts with being brutally honest with God. Uh, next, we need to give away our shame. Oh, I'm sorry, application question here. This is important. Do I care enough about my relationship with God to be honest with him? See, when you care about a relationship, you share truth. When you don't really care about a relationship, you just give partial truth. But when you care deeply about a person, you share truth. So do I care enough about my relationship with God to be honest with him? Next, we need to give away our shame. Look at verse 48 of uh, Luke 7. It says, Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Author Brene Brown defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. And I think so often in the church what's happened is we have confused conviction, feeling bad for what we do wrong, with shame, believing that we are wrong for what we do bad. 
And the church has been kind of a proponent of this. There's the cycle of shame where we tell people that they are bad rather than allowing them to feel conviction for the things that they do that, that are contrary to God's best. So, so often we, do, we don't understand how people can be forgiven of sins, but then just live a completely defeated life. And, and there's, a, there's a huge difference. Conviction is, hey, the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, the choice you're making right now, probably not wise. Shame says, you're no good for that choice you just made. It's a declaration of your value. Conviction is a condition of your heart. Shame is a declaration of your value. And can I just say, shame is not of God. Like there's no part of God's plan for you that he longs for you to live in shame. Shame. In fact, Jesus died and rose from the dead to conquer the shame and the guilt that you were, that you were you know, to experience. He took it all on himself. And so when we go back and live in that shameful place, we're actually not living in the fullness of who God's created us to be. And so here, this woman who has been, lived this sinful life, Jesus just con- completely forgives her of her sins. And that leads to freedom for her. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25 says this, the, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Like there's this aspect of our relationship with God. This isn't just describing their physical, I mean, they were physically naked. This is describing their emotional and their spiritual state of being as well. They were fully exposed before God and yet felt no compulsion to hide. That's God's desire for you. Like there is this intricate and mystical connection between nakedness and shame. That when you feel exposed, your greatest reaction, your first reaction is to try to cover up. And God's saying, hey, when, when you feel exposed before me, I want you to feel fully comfortable. I want you to, be, to know that I love you even in your worst. I, I love you even when you are exposed, even when you do feel naked. See, God's desire for us is to be exposed and uncovered and honest and known. And what we live in is hidden and disguised and secret and concealed. And we read the story of Adam and Eve and we're like, oh my gosh, they, they hid behind fig leaves. Like, how crazy is that? They hid behind a bush and some fig leaves and thought God couldn't see them. How stupid is that? Like, who, who would think that God couldn't see them? We would never do that. That we were hide behind our reputation and our income and our status and our talent and our career and our charisma and a thousand other things that we think will cover up our shame. And God's saying, hey, I see you and I know you fully and I love you anyway. Give me the shame. So the application question here is this. Am I allowing shame to rob me of being real? Am I allowing shame to rob me of being real? And finally, if we're gonna be real, if we're gonna, if we're gonna really believe that being real is greater than being perfect. Um, We need to rediscover our value. We need to rediscover our value. Jesus said to this woman in verse 50, your faith has saved you, go in peace. And one of the things that I've realized as I've gotten older, that I I mistook a lot when I was younger is I confuse self-esteem with self-worth. And there's a big difference between your self-esteem and your self-worth. Self-esteem is conditional. Self-esteem factors in your wounds. Self-esteem is your perception of you. Self-esteem gathers all of your hurt and all of your rejection, all the lies that you believe about yourself, and it informs your heart on how to see you. Self-esteem remembers the one insult you received this last week and forgets the 10 compliments. Self-esteem is this emotional roller coaster that we think we get off of in middle school and high school, but we carry right into adulthood. The stakes are just higher. Self-worth is God-given. Your self-worth isn't up for debate. It's non-negotiable. Your self-worth is based not on who you are, but on who God says you are. Your self-worth can't be taken away. It can't be degraded. It can't be robbed. Your self-worth was given to you before the creation of the world. Your attractiveness, your beauty, your weight, your complexion, your hair, your smile, your body shape, your tax bracket, your employment status, your dating status, your marital status, your past mistakes and failures have nothing to do with your self-worth. God says you are valuable, you are worth something, and that cannot be dictated by anyone else. It's who you are. And if we're going to choose being real over being greater, we have to recognize what is self-esteem and what is self-worth. And we have to stop allowing our self-esteem and how we feel on a particular day to dictate our self-worth and who God says we are. 
And we do that, we recapture our value, we recapture our identity. We start living from the approval of God rather than for the approval of people. And so the application question here as we close, am I allowing my self-esteem to dictate my self-worth? See, being real, I believe, is greater than being perfect. And if we're gonna experience transformation, God doesn't transform perfect people. He transforms honest people. He transforms people who bring their weaknesses and bring their flaws and bring their scars and bring their wounds to God and say, okay, this is all of me. And I'm not going to allow my past, I'm not going to allow my mistakes, I'm not going to allow my shortcomings to determine the value and the worth that you say I have, God. And when we start living authentically, God shows up powerfully. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much just for um, who you say that we are. And it's so easy to live for the opinion and the approval of others. And and so we're here today, God, just saying, um, help us to choose what is greater. Help us to choose being real over being perfect and know that you show up most powerfully when we're honest with you. That's our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.